Welcome to the Medallion Lecture. Uh, I'm Mike Baiocchi, and my job is to introduce Dylan Small to you, uh, which is like an impossible task. This is a very wonderful and prolific person. And so what I'm gonna do is like try to boil down to like three things that you should know about Dylan Small. Um, so first is that Dylan is a builder. And I think like by the official records, there are 28 of us PhD students who he's advised and set off into the world to go do research. But if you do like the back of the envelope calculations, there's more like 400 of us, little Dylan Smalls running around, um, just thinking thoughts that he put into our head. So that's just right there. That's a big impact on the next generation. Um, but if you've done causal inference in like the last decade, you've probably interacted, even if you didn't know that uh, you were doing so, with Dylan. Because what he's done is he's built several of the key structures inside of causal inference. So the American Causal Inference Conference, the Journal of Observational Studies, and the New Society for Causal Inference. Um, I'm sure he wants me to say, and I, I'm gonna say, that he did that with other people. There's a lot of other people, and I can actually see several of you here who helped him build that, but Dylan was really instrumental in doing that. He's an animating force who loves to build these structures that make things better for people. So the second thing you need to know about Dylan is that he's bold. And I choose the word bold because if you know Dylan, he's like one of the most humble and soft-spoken people. Um, and that's a characteristic that people talk about, but I want you to set that aside because you're gonna see how Dylan is intellectually very bold today like when he's talking about protocols, and just like a small thing about protocols if you, if you don't know them, they've existed inside of prospective randomized trials, right? We write down our protocols, we say what we're going to do, and then we debate it, we think about it carefully, what, what, we'll, what we expect to happen, how we're gonna analyze our data, and then we commit to it. We, we put it in stone, we show other people, and then we go collect our data. And that's a responsible, very powerful move. And that's existing inside of randomized trials. Dylan's gonna make a new argument today. And some of us have been slowly building this, but Dylan's pulling it together to move this over to observational studies. This is bold. <laughs> um, and let me try to give you a little bit of context. So for someone who is like mathematically gifted like Dylan, it is safer to stay inside of the ivory tower. It is safer because the walls are big and they're strong and you can do beautiful, delicate math inside of the ivory tower. But that's not what Dylan's doing. Dylan is forcing himself and others to go outside and try to build new structures and find new things. And the protocol is an amazing move towards making observational studies more rigorous. And uh, I, didn't, uh, I think Dylan's, Dylan's folks are here, which I haven't seen you yet. But just in case this is not obvious, I'm gonna give you a couple metaphors about how bold this is. This is the stuff of heroes. Um, so what is a protocol? It's sort of like Homer's Odyssey, when Odysseus like, lashes himself to the mast of the ship uh, because there are these p-value sirens that are going to like, steer us away and pull us away and crash the ship. He's going to safely navigate us, right? But it's also, more sort of Dylan metaphor is it's Babe Ruth calling his shot, saying where he's gonna hit a home run, right, in the World Series and this is gonna be an amazing event. And that's like the fun way to think about a protocol. But it's also Casey at the bat, where like this prolific, amazing person builds these expectations and then strikes out. And that's part of what Dylan's gonna talk about. That it ties us and we're calling our shots and this is a powerful move, this is a bold move. Um, the third thing about Dylan that you should probably know, and I know we don't say this in, we, in this kind of context, but Dylan loves. <laughs> he loves his students, he loves his work, he loves his family. Um, but if you pull his, his record, like his, what he's been publishing, he loves people. And a lot of his research is motivated by going out and at the end of the day, making projects that will make people's lives better. So he's gonna talk about um, some, uh, some of the work he's done on concussions, on, on some of the work he's done on like gun violence. Dylan loves people and over and over again, uh, <laughs> um, it's just powerful to watch. <clears throat> Sorry. So uh, let, me, let me close the remarks by saying, uh, today we're gathering here as a community to give one of our community's biggest, highest honors to Dylan. Uh, but I want you all to understand, um, Dylan, by just being Dylan, 
uh, brings honor to each and every one of us every time he does his study, every time he teaches someone. So I just want to say to Dylan, uh, thank you. And it's my honor uh, to present you with the IMS's uh, medallion. Uh, th thanks, Mike, for the very, very nice introduction. Th thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, so um, we're talking about um, protocols, and um, so um, in, um, for learning about the effect of a treatment, and, um, and for learning about the effect of a treatment, there, there are two basic um, approaches. One is the, the observational study, um, in which we compare units who observe to take treatment versus those who observe to take control, and, and then the, the randomized trial in which in which the units are randomly assigned to take treatment or control, and we compare them. So the, the, the randomized trial is considered the gold standard, but it's sometimes impractical or, or unethical to force people to take treatment. So in, in practice, observational studies are, are widely used, um, and they've had some big successes and failures. Uh, so the most famous success is um, evidence for, for smoking causing um, um, harming health comes primarily from observational studies. Um, another big success is that you know, um, doctors used to prescribe alcohol to, to pregnant women, um, and it was observational studies that discovered the, the problem of fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, but th there have also been some big failures. Um, most famously, um, hormone re replacement therapy used to be, uh, observational studies suggested that it, that it prevented heart disease among postmenopausal women, and it was widely prescribed. And a randomized trial showed that it was um, actually harmful. Um, another famous for failure is uh, Linus Pauling, who um, he won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry and Peace, and then later in life um, was very into promoting vitamin C, and he thought that vitamin C cured cancer, and he did an observational study suggesting that vitamin C cured cancer, but when they've done randomized trials, they haven't found any effect of vitamin C on cancer. So a, a big question is, is, is it possible to make observational studies more reliable? Um, so w w William Cochran kind of founded the statistical theory of observational studies. Um, he, his basic advice was that the planner of an observational study should um, ask him or herself the question, how would the study be conducted if it were possible to do it by controlled experimentation? So in other words, try, try to make the observational study uh, as, as much like a randomized trial as possible. Um, so let's look at, at um, some of the, the, the strengths of um, uh, a randomized trial. So basically, three, three basic strengths. One is that you, you have the random assignment that makes sure that the treatment and control group are uh, comparable in every way, that, they have this, uh, that on average they have the same health, the same wealth. Um, second is uh, identical processes, which, which is that that we treat, the, the, the treatment and control group are handled, that the, their data is collected in an identical way except for the one group receiving treatment. So this includes things like um, having a blinding and having a placebo. Um, and then the, the third is a, a protocol that, that describes before the study's done how the data is going to be collected and then what are the, what are the hypotheses that, that are going to be tested and how the data is going to be analyzed to test those hypotheses. Uh, so the, the number one, the, the random assignment is usually not possible in an observational study because we're, we're not, um, we're just observing whether people take treatment or control. Um, the, 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 the identical processes may be hard to achieve. It's oftentimes hard to do blinding and placebo in an observational study where people choose whether to take treatment or control. But, but the, the, the protocol part, that doesn't seem like there's anything special about a randomized trial for having a protocol. Um, it seems like it could equally be done in an observational study. But, but in, in practice, uh, protocols are, are used much less frequently in observational studies. Um, and uh, Don, Don Rubin has written about this, and I'll, I'll quote him. He said, um, for, for, for drug approval, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration requires carefully specified randomized designs and specified primary uh, um, analyses and secondary supporting analyses. There is thus tremendous pressure to live with the answers that come from pre-specified designs and analyses. Um, uh, but in, in, in observational studies, in, 
in epidemiology and the social sciences, the outcome data are frequently used over and over and over again to fit various models, try different transformations, l look at results discarding influential outliers, et cetera. Oh, I should have used the, the five indicator variables for age rather than age is continuous because the p-values for treatment effects are greatly improved. How many reported ana analyses that we see in journals are designed a priori rather than are the results of repeated and unreported exploratory analyses? Uh, and then Ruben uh, he continues, he says, uh, uh, objectivity can be obtained in the design of observational studies, although it is uh, typically not as easy, as, easy as, as in randomized experiments. And of course, objectivity is not the same as finding truth, but I believe it is generally a necessary ingredient if we are to find truth. The key idea is to conduct the design before seeing any outcome data. The design should include the specification of the analysis that is to be carried out on the outcome data. Um, so what I'm going to be, um, I'm going to give two personal examples of trying to implement the kind of observational studies protocols that Ruben is talking about, and then talk about some different considerations in observational study protocols compared to randomized trial protocols, and then um, finish out with some open problems. Uh, so my, my first example is uh, a study of uh, playing American high school football on later life mental functioning. Um, and it was led by Samir Deshpande and Bryden Hasegawa, and we also had some, um, several clinical co collaborators, and, and Mike also helped with this study. Um, so the, the study started when I um, saw, first saw the, um, uh, in December 2015, I saw the movie uh, Concussion, uh, which is about, uh, so Dr. Bennett Omalo is a pathologist from, Pitt, he's originally from Africa, and he was, um, uh, you know, worked in Pittsburgh. Uh, he, was, he did not know anything about American football. Um, and, but he was, he was on duty when the, the Pittsburgh Steeler great Mike Webster uh, d died and, and, and was asked to do an autopsy. So uh, Webster, after, after he retired, had, um, was ex had experienced uh, de depression, um, memory loss, and, and erratic behavior. And when Omalu um, autopsied, I mean, he found kind of tangles in the brain which were, were similar to what you see in Alzheimer's, but Webster was way too young uh, to, to, to simply see those tangles. Um, and so um, Omalu diagnosed him with what he called chronic trauma encephalopathy, or CTE, uh, which he thought was caused by the repeated um, hits from playing football. And then he, um, Omalu subsequently went on to autopsy several other NFL players who had experienced behavior problems before death, and, um, and he also found some of these tangles. Um, and he tried to alert the, the NFL to the problem, and the, the NFL kind of tried to silence him. So um, after seeing the movie, I was pretty fired up about this issue. Um, and I, I looked at some of the studies, and they were mostly about um, the effect of playing pro football. But of course, you know, very few people get to play pro football, but many people get, you know, um, high school. Uh, football is the biggest boys' high school sport, more than a million play a year. So I was thinking, you know, uh, and I realized that the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, which I'd worked with in previously, contained information about playing football in high school. So I was thinking, um, you know, if we could find a detrimental effect of playing football, it would be an important finding, and maybe get me mentioned in my f favorite uh, newspaper, the New York Times. Uh, so um, a little more about the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. So it's it's. It's a publicly available data set. It's a great data set. Um, it has, it was a random sample of one third of Wisconsin high school seniors in 1957. And then they followed them up basically every decade of their life. It includes high school activities and then cognitive functioning and mental health measured at ages 53, 65, and 72. And it, it has, it's very well followed up. There's very little missing data and fairly little attrition. Uh -huh. So the big challenge in any observational study is confounding that the, the treatment and control groups may be different in not different ways other than the treatment because you just, they just observe to take treatment or control. Um, so the, the good feature of the WLS is that there are many of the potential confounders are measured. It has information on like parents' education, parents' income, also IQ. Um, so you know, th there are various ways to control for observed confounders. Um, you know, one is just re regression. You can regress the outcome and the treatment and the confounders. You can use um, non-parametric regression like uh, BART and causal forests. Um, you can use inverse probability weighting. I mean, 
So what I, the method I'm going to be talking about today is, is matching, um, and matching goes well with, with trying to design the study before analysis um, and have a protocol, although these other methods can also be um, used well in a protocol as well. Um, so in, in matching, the idea is we construct match sets of treated and control subjects with similar covariates. Um, here, here we used full matching in which the, the match sets consist of one treated and one or more co um, control subject or one control and one or more treated subject uh, to minimize the covariate distance within match sets. Um, and Paul Rosenbaum has shown that, that um, the full matching is an optimal stratification for an observational study. Um, and here, uh, Ben Hansen has a nice pa uh, R package, R match, for implementing full matching in a polynomial time. Um, the, the covariate the distance we use here is a Mahalanobis distance with a propensity score caliper. So what, what you get out of full matching are match sets that like here this is two control units matched to one treated, here this is one control matched to two treated, here's just a pair match of one control to one treated. Um, so you, know, the, the, you won't be able to see this, but the, these are all the, all the variables that we matched on. Um, it here, here, here's just focusing on two of them. Uh, so parental income, so this is in 1957, so that's why it's so small. Um, but so on average, football players, they're, they're, they came from wealthier families. Um, but after matching, the, the match controls, it's pretty similar in terms of parental income. Um, with, so this is whether the teacher encouraged the um, student to go to college. So football players are more likely to be encouraged to go to college. Um, 57% to 45%. But after we did this matching, it's, it's pretty close, 55% to 57%. So basically the matching produces match controls that look similar to the football players on, on all these measured covariates. Um, so by examining this, this balance table, um, it's, it's helpful. It, it helps to facilitate critical discussion. So first of all, it help, we, helps with kind of asking, are, are the treated and match control groups similar enough on the measured confounders for fair comparison. If, if a variable, uh, like if we thought the income still wasn't balanced enough, we could try to make it more balanced by adding a penalty to the distance for um, mismatches on, on say, parental income. Um, it, it also sort of sparks discussion with collaborators. Of they look at this table and they can see what's, what's not there, it, you know, what are potentially important unmeasured confounders. So after examining our table, um, one of my collaborators collaborate, commented that the APO gene variant wasn't there. The um, APO gene variant is um, um, is the um, uh, it, it, it's it's a gene variant that's that's um, uh, related to all uh, co correlated with Alzheimer's. So um, and it's not available in the public version of the WLS, but you can you can request they did genotype subjects and you can request them. Re request the genotyping data. So we did, and, and fortunately, it looked like the APO was balanced between football and non-football players. Um, another collaborator commented that uh, depressed poets don't play football. Um, so I'm not, um, not endorsing that as, as a correct observation, but um, it, it did make us think about, you know, what there might be personality differences between athletes and non-athletes that aren't captured by the measured variables. And it's kind of get this cartoon gets at that so you have this young jock this young athlete saying i play every sport and have the body of an adonis um, and you have a, a young geek who's saying I, I collect action figures and my arms are pretty skinny um, and then you have an old jock who's saying my shoulders jacked up my back's a wreck and i walk with a limp um, and then you have the old geek is saying my, my arms are still skinny but they still but they work um, so it's getting at that you know um, foot athletes and non-athletes have a lot of differences that might not be captured um, in just the measured variables. Um, so one, one way you can try to design an observational study to deal with a, an unmeasured confounder that you know that you're worried about is to use multiple control groups as proposed by Donald Campbell. So the idea is you try to find two control groups that are, that are similar on the measured uh, covariates but are far apart in terms of the U that you're worried about. Um, and if, if, it, if, if the control groups then have similar outcomes, and these outcomes are very different than the treated group, then the, the, then the, the, the U can't be responsible for those differences between the treatment and control group, because the U is very, part, for, very far apart in the control group, but the control groups still have similar outcomes. Um, 
So we thought about, you know, could we use this here? Um, and then, so, so we're concerned about this unmeasured confounder of, be, of being a jock, being an athlete. So we thought of two control groups. One are um, men who um, played a, a sport but not football, played a non-collision sport, such as baseball, basketball, or track, and men who didn't play a sport at all. So we, um, inc and I'll talk more, we, we can incorporate these multiple control groups into, the, into our um, design. Um, Another um, design aspect we had to think about was, was what should our outcomes be? So there's kind of, um, you know, like in, in the concussion movie and with, in the CT literature, people have worried about two sort of domains that um, playing football might affect. One is um, cognitive functioning and the other is mental health. But there, there are a lot of different measures of cognitive functioning and mental health in the WLS. And there's also um, three age groups you, you, could, you can measure it at age 53, 65, and 72. Um, so one possibility is just to look at all 33 outcomes and, and, and correct for multiple testing. Um, what we did is we, we chose two primary outcomes. Um, uh, depression at age 65 is measured by the, the modified CESD score. And then we, the, for cognition, we, we created an index to combine two of the, the measures. Um, delayed word recall, that's, um, you, you, they read 10 words to, 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 to a person and then 10 minutes later they ask them to um, say back as many of the words as they can remember. And then letter fluency is they pick a letter, let's say like L, and say, um, um, say as many words as start with L in a minute. Um, and we, we measured these two at age 65 and, and combine them into one index. So we had these, so we have these two outcomes. Um, and we're going to control for the family-wise error rate using Bonfroni Home. So we're going to test each of them at level 0.025. Um, and th the way we incorporate the multiple control groups is through um, order testing, in which we first compare the outcome, um, the, the football players, to all controls. And then if it's significant, we go on to test the football players versus each control group. So this, this ordered way of testing con controls the family-wise error rate. Um, and then we said we'd have other outcomes as secondary outcomes. Um, and then um, we, we wrote a protocol and we, we posted it on archive before we looked at the outcome data. So um, the way it um, looks is, so, um, so we had you know, kind of background and motivation um, and then um, eligibility and exclusion criteria um, and then we, then we talked about what the outcomes are, what are the primary outcomes, what's the justification for them. Um, and then, then the protocol was written after the matching was done. So we described the matching, like in the appendix, we have these charts that show the, the, the balance that the matching gave. Um, and then, and then, we, then we described you know, how we're gonna test the outcomes, how we're gonna control the family-wise error rate, you know, the, the specific tests that we're gonna uh, uh, do, um, and then the secondary analysis. Um, so then here, um, then after posting the protocol, we then, um, uh, and we, we'd actually already written the code and stuff, um, and then, then we analyzed the data. So here, here are the results. Um, so these are showing, so these are lettered valued box plots, and they're showing, so this is the cognition, and this is the, the depression. Um, the, the C are all controls, the C1 are the non-sport controls, the, the C2 are the sport non-collision controls, and the T are the football players. Um, and so you can see it, it doesn't look like there's much of an effect of playing football. Um, the, the, the pluses are the, the means in the groups. Um, and that's shown, the, the, um, here are the confidence intervals for effect sizes. So you see with cognition, um, we're estimating that football decreases cognition by 0.05 standard deviations. And even the, the upper, uh, the, the, the lower end of the confidence interval, it's, it's less than a 0.2 effect size. So by Cone's sort of effect size criterion, an effect size less than 0.2 is considered small. So we're saying that there's, at most football is having sort of a small effect size as effect on cognition. And for depression, so, so lower depression, a lower score means less depressed. So we're, so we're estimating that football um, reduces depression um, and it's actually significant. significant. The confidence interval doesn't, uh, only contains um, reductions in depression. Um, uh, 
So we, um, so at, we, after we got the, the paper published in, in a journal, um, the Wharton Media Office helped us to kind of try to promote the, the paper, the press, and this, this, um, this writer from the, the, the Verge wrote this article. Um, it says, uh, high school football isn't linked to, to brain problems later on um, if you play in the 1950s. So it kind of, it's kind of getting <laughs> um, that the, the findings may not generalize to today's players, that the game is, is pretty different today. But, um, but it said the subtext, this counters some of the narrative around traumatic brain injury. Um, we did, the, um, you know, our media representative did, did try to send the paper to the New York Times, but we, um, they, they, they didn't mention us. And, um, <laughs> um, Um, so, so now, um, getting back to, so what, what was the value of having the protocol? Um, well, we kind of hoped in, in some sense that, you know, that, that we're going to, we're going to find playing high school football would harm long-term cognitive functioning and mental health. I mean, not, not cause that's good, but just that I thought that was going to, going to get me attention. I thought it was going to be an important finding. Um, and so I, I think if we had just, if we had say estimate a regression without a protocol, when the results came out not the way we hoped, I think we might have tried hard to adjust the model with transformations, different covariates, not 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 in an attempt to um, to you know open, openly cheat, but just because we, we we would have thought oh this maybe we maybe we, you know maybe we um, didn't fit the right model, um, um, and it's not really a you know um, doing diagnostics under regression is a good thing. The the, the problem is. We, we might have tried, I think we probably would have tried less hard if the results came out the way we hoped. I mean, just because if they came out the way we hoped, we would try to do our due diligence, but we would think, oh, that th these results make sense, and we wouldn't look that hard to change um, and adjust the model. Um, so uh, in, in Dante's Inferno, he, he, he wrote, writes of, that when he met St. Thomas Aquinas in paradise, St. Thomas cautioned him, opinion hasty often can incline to the wrong side, and then affection for one's own opinion binds, confines the mind. Um, so I think what, what a protocol is trying to do is protect against the, the kind of confirmation bias that, that St. Thomas is, is talking about. Um, that because it, it, it sets what the analysis you're going to do, it sets it in place. Um, and, and, and you're forced to, to, to live with the results. Um, and when I've talked about protocols, some people have asked me, said, you know, in randomized trials, you do the protocol before random assignment, so before the outcome data. So it, it protects against some dishonesty on, on the part of the investigator because they're forced to say what the analysis is. In an observational study, the data is, is usually, um, it's usually there, and, and so there's nothing to really prevent somebody from being dishonest and, and actually analyzing the outcome data and then writing a protocol. Um, but my answer is the purpose of an observational study protocol is not to protect against dishonesty. It doesn't do that. What it is is it's a tool for an honest investigator to do good science, to, to protect themselves against confirmation bias. Um, okay. So I'm just going to give one um, other quick example of an observational study protocol I've um, worked on. Um, and this is a study of um, how gun removal um, from intimate partner violence abusers. And it's a joint work with Richard Burke and Susan Sorensen. And it took on some personal importance for us that our, um, our beloved um, course administrator, Tanya Winder, um, she um, a few recently, her, her um, niece, Morgan Braxton, was killed by a uh, gun and intimate, intimate partner violence. Um, so this is a study that we did with the um, Philadelphia Police Department. And here, uh, some background on it is that the Violence Against Women Act prohibits a person from buying or possessing a gun if she or he is subject to a domestic violence uh, restraining order. So the, the prohibitions on buying a gun are implemented through background checks. But the law doesn't specify how you prohibit possession of a gun um, if somebody's um, subject to a DVRO. Um, but P Pennsylvania goes further in that they, they have a law requiring the arresting officer to seize all weapons used by the the defendant in the commission of the alleged offense if a probable cause arrest can be made and the officer has observed recent physical injury to the victim or other corroborative evidence. Um, however, it's not always complied with. In the data we have, when an arrest was made, the gun was only removed about half of the time. The officer also can remove the, 
that does have the discretion to remove the gun even when an arrest was not made. Um, so the question we want to look at is when, when the gun is removed, you know, is that effective in reducing subsequent um, intimate partner violence calls to the police and subsequent injuries to the victim? Um, and so, so, so working with the Philadelphia Police Department on this, and they, they're, what they're hoping is to show that the law, that removing the gun is effective and that, that then they could um, try to use that to sort of work with uh, officers to comply more with the law. So the, the, the data we have from the police is um, all intimate partner violence calls in Philadelphia in 2013. There were about 29,000 such calls um, and about 80% of them were first time calls during the year and 20% of them were, were repeat calls um, for, during the year. And, and about 1% of them involved a, a gun, um, brandishing the gun or threatening with the gun, pistol whipping or firing the gun. And the gun was only removed in about 25% of the calls. Um, so the, the measure confounders we have are the sex, race, and age of the suspect and victim, uh, whether the suspect has a history of substance abuse, domestic violence, um, whether they're under court supervision, and whether the suspect fled the scene, the police arrested the suspect at the scene, and the victim's emotional response. Um, so I wrote a protocol now. Now this time I did not, um, I did not post on archive. It's just something I, I wrote on my, my computer. Um, so it's not nearly as nice. Um, but I, I um, put here, it, these are the propensity scores we fit. Um, this is the balance table of the uh, covariates we had from, from doing the match. And then this is the, the analysis plan. So what we said with the, the, the primary outcome is going to be the rate of, of subsequent calls during, during the 2013, after the first call, um, uh, subsequent calls in which there was visible injuries um, to the victim. Um, and we said we would do a, a weighted Poisson regression model with, with weights for the matching. So, so, so these are the, the, the results. Um, so we, we estimate that removing a gun increases the rate of future calls. It's, it's kind of a huge point estimate, but you know, we have a, a relatively small number of cases, so we have a wide confidence interval, but it is, it is uh, significant. Um, so um, and th this is not what we were hoping for. We were hoping that, that um, <laughs> removing the gun reduces calls. Um, so we were quite disappointed with this result. Um, you know, we sort of, afterwards thought about well, what could explain this. So one of the things we thought of is, okay, removing the gun is not, is not changing the, the abuser's behavior. Um, you know, a positive spin on it is that the, the victims after, after the gun is removed might be less fearful of retribution and more comfortable calling for assistance. Um, a negative spin is maybe the abuser may, instead of sort of silently intimidating with the gun, they more, may resort to more visible domination strategies. Um, leading to more calls. Um, and, and another explanation could just be unmeasured confounding, that you know, if the officer thinks that future violence is more of a threat, they're more likely to remove the gun, um, and that in, that in ways that may not be explained by the measured confounders. So um, uh, sensitivity analysis is one approach to, to trying to address concerns about unmeasured confounding. So um, I'll talk here, just describe um, Paul Rosenbaum's method of um, sensitivity analysis, the, the, the gamma method. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sensitivity parameter, gamma, which represents if you have two cases that are the same on all the measured covariates. So here you have a 17-year-old male suspect who fled the scene and a 16-year-old female victim. Um, so if there were no unmeasured confounders, then the gamma is, is the odds that one, one case would, would be treated, have the gun removed um, compared to the other. So if there's no unmeasured confounders, they, they should have the same odds of having the gun removed, gamma's one. If there was an unmeasured confounder of sort of the police's perception of future violence risk, and that un, and, and the police were, were, had twice the odds of removing the gun from the one with higher future violence risk, that, that would correspond to gamma's two. Um, if if the, the um, future violence risk, the police perception of that, if that tripled your odds of removing the gun, then gamma would be three. Um, so what we, what we can do is for each gamma, we can figure out 
what would be the maximum p-value for testing no treatment effect? So, so this is what we saw before with no unmeasured confounders. The p-value is 0.032. And then this says, you know, e even if there's an unmeasured, even if there's the unmeasured future violence risk and it increases the odds 1.1 times or 10% of removing the gun, the, the p-value would still be less than 0.05. There, there'd still be evidence that uh, removing the gun increases future calls. And basically it goes, it, it, it's insensitive up to about 1.24. So if, if, if the, um, the future violence risk increases the odds of removing the gun um, 1.24 times, we still have evidence for a treatment effect. And then if, it, if it's 1.25 times, then the p-value would just be above 0.05 and we, we no longer have evidence at level 0.05. Um, so the, the, these findings are kind of, they're not super sensitive, but they're not very insensitive. So an example of a very insensitive finding is from one of the early studies of smoking and lung cancer. That was sensitive at gammas 5.47. So that means that even if there was a, some um, unmeasured confounder, like some genotype that made you more likely to smoke, even if, if it was five times more likely to smoke, um, it would, we'd still have evidence that smoking caused lung cancer. But like the hormone replacement heart disease therapy study I talked about, that was sensitive at gammas 1.13. So, so that was more sensitive than this, this gun study. Um, so then just kind of finishing up with this gun study, just talking about the, the value of the protocol. Um, again, we, we hoped gun removal would be effective. Um, and if we had just estimated a regression model without a protocol and the regression estimated gun removal was, was harmful, was, then it, it would have been natural for us to consider other covariates, um, transformations, and, and other adjustments to the model. Um, by creating a strict protocol, it made us think hard about the, the covariates to include uh, coding issues with the covariates and other things before looking at the outcome. Um, I think it, you know, here I didn't post the protocol, I just wrote it on my computer, and I think that um, when I went to the analysis, I found I hadn't been as clear about a lot of things um, as I would have liked, so I, I was sloppier. So I think posting the protocol is, is a good discipline. Um, even better than posting the protocol is that some journals are now accepting registered reports where you submit your, your protocol and they, they'll accept the paper just based on the protocol and say, you know, re regardless of what, what the outcomes come out, they're going to publish the study. Um, so um, now I'm going to move on to talking about a few different considerations in observational study protocols compared to randomized trial protocols. Um, so the first has to do with whether the protocol is sort of before or after treatment assignment. In, in a randomized trial, the protocol is written before subjects are randomly assigned to treatment. Um, but in, in matching, you, you, matching kind of imperfectly takes the place of random assignment. But protocols in observational studies are typically written after matching, so kind of like after treatment assignment. Um, and so I'm going to talk about one potential problem with that, is, which is um, researcher hope bias from judgment about which covariates to match on. So I'll explain what, what I mean by researcher hope bias. So uh, a, big, you know, a big issue in designing an observational study is deciding which covariates to match on. Um, and you know, a, a potential problem with some, if, if a covariate is highly imbalanced between the treatment and control group, if you match on that, it's going to drive up your variance, your estimated treatment effect. It's kind of, it's analogous to multicollinearity and regression. Um, so there's a tension between, to get an unbiased estimate of the treatment effect, we want to rigorously control for all possible confounders, but at the same time, if we, if we try to match on everything, we may make the variance of the treatment effect estimate so high that the study is sort of uninformative. It's sometimes called uh, overmatching. So we may be looking for um, variables that, that, that are the reason that we don't have to match on them. Um, so one, one legitimate reason for not matching on a covariate is if, if the covariate is not a confounder but is instead an instrumental variable. Um, so let me explain what, what an instrumental variable is. So, so here, um, T is our treatment. Um, y is our outcome, and U is some un unmeasured confounders. Um, and then um, Z in this diagram is an instrumental variable it, it, because it satisfies three assumptions. So first, it's, it's related to the uh, treatment. Um, uh, second, it's, 
so here is, you have this X through this. It's, it, so, so there's no arrow here. That, um, so that the only effect of the Z on the outcome is through the treatment. It has no direct effect. And then here, here this is also an X that there, there's no arrow, that Z is not related to the unmeasured confounders. So, so uh, an instrumental variable Z, it's, it's not a confounder. Um, and, and matching on an, on, on an, on, on an IV, it increases the bias and the variance. So, so if you know something's an IV, you would like to not match on it. Um, but the, the, the problem is that, uh, that you know, if Z is related to you here, now, now it's a confounder and not an instrumental variable, and not matching on it can increase bias. Um, so we, we thought about two possible um, instrumental variables for the gun study. W one is the, um, whether the suspect fled the scene, and the other is whether the um, police arrested the suspect at the scene. Um, so these are, um, so you can see with the suspect fled the scene, the gun is much more likely to be removed if the suspect didn't flee the scene than if they did, 50% uh, to 13%. I mean that, because if, if the suspect flees the scene, then it's very hard, it's hard for the police to, to be able to seize the gun. The suspect is typically taking the gun with them. Um, so, so it's definitely related to the treatment, um, and we were thinking maybe, maybe it's not related to unmeasured confounders. Um, so uh, the, the, the variance of the estimated treatment effect is related to how balanced the propensity scores are, the propensity scores of the probability of the treatment given the confounders. So you can see here, this is all variables, and then this is if you take out the suspect fleeing the scene and the police arresting the suspect at the scene. So you, so you see that the, if you take these two variables out, the propensity scores are more balanced. And this, this shows sort of a measure of the effective sample size in terms of pairs of when you do full matching. So you see that by removing these two variables, you would increase the effective sample size by 10 pairs or 20%. Um, However, we were um, that the, um, these might not be valid instruments. They they, they may be um, so in the, in this um, diagram, we're looking at how the bias would be affected if they're not valid instruments. So so on the on the x-axis is the correlation between the unmeasured variable u, which might be the kind of the the um, risk of future uh, violence, and and t the gun removal, um, and then here is the um, correlation between U and the instrument Z. So this is this is a the Z star is a linear combination of the two. The suspect fled the scene, and the police arrest the suspect of the scene. That's that's the best for, um, combination for predicting the treatment given the other covariates. So if if these are valid instruments, then this correlation between U and and the instrument should be zero. And you see then then we're in this yellow region where the bias is less by not matching on on the Z. But but if you have a little bit of correlation. Uh, between the U and the Z, you quickly get into this red region where the bias is less, where you're better off matching. Um, and so, so not matching would increase the effective sample size by 20 percent, but we're, we're pretty concerned about that these are not valid instruments because the, the, the suspect fleeing the scene, that seems like it might easily be related to future violence risks, so that, that, it, that, it, it, that there would be this, this correlation here. So overall, we decided it, was, it wasn't that we'd be better off matching for this, this study. Um, but su suppose it had been different. Suppose that the sample size with matching on everything was, was, was the effective sample size was 20 pairs. And if we didn't match on fled and arrested, the, if the, the effective sample size would go up to 50. Now we'd be kind of in the situation where with, with, with only 20 pairs, the study would basically have no, no power. We'd have no hope of learning anything. Whereas not matching, we'd at least you know be up to, to effective sample of 50 and have some kind of hope. So we might you know just even though we were concerned that these weren't valid instruments, just in the hope of having some kind of study we could learn something for from, we might not match. And I think th this can lead to um, what I call research or hope bias, that the bias from not matching on potential confounders because the researchers sort of hopes they aren't true confounders rather than thinks they aren't true confounders just to have um, some hope of having this, the, the, the study have power. Um, so a, a way of, so if, if we were, in, instead of doing the protocol after the match, if we did the protocol before the match, that would avoid this researcher 
hope bias because we, we would have to specify what covariates to match on before we saw um, what kind of match we got, before we saw that, say, not ma matching on something would, would, would be important for improving the variance. Um, so um, so that, that's the, the advantage of um, doing the protocol before the match is that it would, 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 would maybe not completely avoid but, but mitigate this researcher hope bias. Um, but, but there are some advantages to, to, do, to doing it the way that's normally done after matching. I'll, I'll talk about three advantages. So the first is, as we saw, when, when we looked at the match balance table, it was only after, so I, I had shown the variables to my collaborator before we did the match, but they, it was only after seeing the match balance table that my collaborator commented, depressed poets don't play football. Um, and that helped us to improve the design of the observational study by adding multiple control groups um, to, uh, to address concerns about the unmeasured confounder from, from being a jock. Um, so we often think it's the insights from looking at the match balance table. Um, a, a second reason that sort of after matching protocol, I think the advantage is it, it helps in, in deciding which covariates to match on thoughtfully. So um, the, there are oftentimes many covariates you could consider matching on or controlling for. We, we, there were actually 68 variables that the, collected in, in the gun study by the police. So we only ended up, you know, we chose 12 to match on. Um, it's difficult to think about many covariates. Um, so two common approaches are you, most commonly I think in empirical studies is, is the, the subject matter experts will choose a few covariates they think are important a priori. Um, another approach is to more automatically control for a long list of covariates, possibly using model selection. But, not, but because you have a long list of covariates, not really paying a lot of attention to the nature and quality of, of the covariates. So there, you know, and there are various reasons why you, you might not want to match on a covariate. I talked about being an instrument. Another is if it's a post-treatment covariate. Uh, but it's hard to look over this closely if you have many variables. Um, so uh, Cochrane suggested an intermediate approach in which you choose a few covariates a priori, then you screen for additional covariates that are in balance between the treated and control group, and now you have a short, smaller list, and then you can carefully consider the covariates you have on this list and decide which to control for. Um, and you, you, Small and Rosenbaum, we updated the suggestion with focusing on residual imbalances after the initial match, so it's definitely something you have to do after the match. So, I th um, and this is what we did in the, the gun study, um, and I think overall this led to um, kind of, you know, it helps a, th uh, a manageable, thoughtful way to choose covariates. Um, a, a third advantage to an after matching protocol is that it, it, it facilitates bringing in qualitative data. So we, we had in the, in the, the gun study, we, not only do we have the, these quantitative variables, the police also wrote narratives of the incident. Um, so a limitation of qualitative research is it's, it's hard to do it on a large scale. Um, you know, here it's hard to read through a lot of narratives, and you know, in other da data sets, you have you know, even sort of millions of observations. It's impossible to go through qualitative data on all of them. Um, but what we can do is focus on a few observations and thickly describe them. Um, and matching is sort of helpful with that because you can. Um, so, like in, in our study, what we're going to do is we're going to com compare a few gun removal versus gun non removal cases that are similar on the measure confounders and see if there's any differences in the narratives that, are, that suggest unmeasured confounders that we might then um, create um, variables for. Uh, and in, in this work by you, Small, Alvadanius, um, Harding, and Rosenbaum, we developed an optimal matching for this kind of thick description in which we, we have tried to get good overall balance and a few match sets where the treating and control are very close, and that's um, implemented in the R package, thick match. Uh, so, uh, so here, here, so we, 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 we got, we had five close pairs that we, that we found. Uh, so here's one of them. Um, so here you had, uh, set, in both cases, a 17-year-old male suspect who fled the scene, and the victim was an 18-year-old, uh, here at one case, a 16-year-old female, one case, an 18-year-old female. And these are what the narratives look like. And so if you look at what's in yellow, in one case, the gun, when the gun was removed, the suspect had shot the victim in the chest. When the, when the gun was not removed, here, here the suspect had actually just had shot the door, but not the person. Um, so we think this may be an important 
you know, unmeasured confounder, it, it may be very different for future violence risk if it's shooting the person rather than uh, shooting some object. Uh, and this was another case. Uh, so now you have a 39-year-old male suspect and a 38-year-old male suspect uh, arrested at the scene. In both cases, the victim was a 26-year-old female. Um, and if you see here in the gun remove case, this part in yellow, um, in this case, we saw that, okay, it said when the husband pulled out a black handgun, waving it in her and daughter's direction, stating, stay out of my face. Um, this made us think, oh, you know, so now this, a child's involved, maybe that affects future violence risk. So based on these, these two cases, what we did is we, we created two new covariates by searching the text of the narratives. One is we searched, did kill or shoot you appear in the narrative? And another is, did the narrative mention children in, in any way, by any of these keywords? Um, and then what we did is um, we matched on, uh, so, so here's our initial match, and now we added to our 12 initial variables these two variables and did a new match. And, and then these are our inferences. So, uh, I mean, the point estimate changed a lot, because, you know, as I said, it's kind of, it's not very, um, you know, it's a relatively small, um, data set, but, 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 but the qualitative inference is the same, that, that we have um, evidence that, that gun removal increases future calls. So it didn't, the overall results were kind of consistent. And, and by looking at this potential um, threat to validity, by, by looking for unmeasured confounding, I mean, here we found that it didn't change the results, but overall that kind of just strengthens our inference. Um, so sort of in summarizing after, you know, having a protocol after matching or before matching, the advantages of after are you get insights from looking at the match balance table that might lead to better design of the study, um, helps you in choosing covariates thoughtfully by screening if, if the after facilitates bringing qualitative data. But the disadvantage of after is that you have this researcher hope bias. So I think this might be an area for more work and how to reduce researcher, researcher hope bias in, in protocols after matching. Um, so um, the second area I want to talk about is kind of different between observational study and randomized trial protocols. It has to do with uh, how they deal with multiple outcomes. So you remember in the football study, we had like 33 possible outcomes. And what we what we did is we ended up choosing like two primary outcomes and controlling by Bonfroni. Um, we, could, we could have considered the many outcomes and then tested them by either you know, Bonfroni, the false discovery rate, we could have selected the hypothesis in some way and, and did conditional inference on the selected or, the, or done a split sample. Um, so I'm gonna focus on three of these methods and sort of compare them in randomized trial um, and observational studies. So one is just to choose one outcome. Another is to uh, control for that, the family-wise error rate for all outcomes using Bonfroni home. And then the third, I'm gonna just, for the split sample, I'm just gonna, for simplicity, just choose one particular implementation. I'm not recommending you would do this in practice, but um, you to take the, um, divide the data randomly into a planning sample and an analysis sample. On the one, one third of the data is for the planning sample. You're gonna choose the outcome with the smallest p-value on that and then go ahead and test that on the analysis sample, the other two thirds of the data. Um, so this is looking at how these three methods compare in a randomized trial where uh, you, you have 500 match pairs and you have 100 outcomes and well, there's only one outcome that's affected by the treatment. The other 99 are, are not affected by the treatment. Um, and so, and here's this, this on, on the x-axis is the effect size and of the, the outcome that's affected by the treatment. And the the y-axis is power. Um, and the red here is assuming that you, you do an, um, is the choosing one outcome. And we're, we're gonna give it really, a, um, we're gonna make it favorable to that by saying that you have a two-thirds chance of choosing the one outcome out of the 100 that's affected and only a one-third chance of choosing one of the other 99 nulls. So we're giving it, you know, a good chance in, the, in this a priori uh, method of getting the right outcome. Um, and then the green is Bonfroni and the blue is the split sample. So we see that kind of, if, if the effect size is, is small, the, the a priori, that's two-thirds chance of getting the correct outcome uh, does the best. 
Um, if the effect size is big enough, then Bonferroni has a good chance of picking up the, the outcome that's affected, and Bonferroni does better. And Bonferroni always beats split sample here for this randomized trial setting. Um, so now, in an observational study, um, so in terms of thinking about what power should, we should look at, well, I mean, a big, cons you know, in an observational study, we're, we're almost always concerned about bias for unmeasured confounders. Um, and this, this cartoon kind of gets at that, um, you know, you have your uh, control group, they're all in control, and then your, your treatment group, they're out of control, um, and they're, they're all wild. Um, and it, it kind of gets at that, that um, you know, no matter how much you've measured confounders, there's typically, one group's taking the treatment and one's not, and there's all typically t reasons for that difference. Um, and so, so most people think that um, in an observational study, evidence for a causal effect is only compelling if it's insensitive to some amount of bias. So for example, Sir Richard Dahl said, no single epidemiologic study is persuasive by itself unless the lower limit of its 95% confidence level falls above a threefold increase risk. So that he's basically saying that he, will, he only thinks a study is persuasive if it's insensitive at gamma of three. Uh, Robert Temple said something similar, my basic rule of thumb is if the relative risk isn't three or four, forget about it. Um, so basically they're kind of saying that the power of interest is not, we don't care so much about the power to detect an effect with no bias, gamma is one. We care about the power to detect an effect that's insensitive to some bias, gamma greater than one. For example, gamma is three. So, so, so this now shows um, same setting as before, 100 outcomes, only one's affected. Um, but now we're looking at power at gamma is three in an observational study. Um, and the effect sizes are bigger because we, we wouldn't have any power to detect um, a small effect size at gamma is three. But um, what we see now is that now split sample dominates and it, it even beats the, op, the a priori guess of having a two thirds chance of correctly guessing the correct outcome. Um, so let's look at some intuition for why, why the, split sample is doing well in the observational study. Um, so com comparing it to the a priori guess, well, the, the disadvantage, of course, the split sample is you're losing one third of the sample for, to put it in the planning sample, and you're not, you don't get to use that in the analysis. Um, but in, in, in an observational study, the increase in sample size has limited effect on the power um, when gamma is much greater than one. So here you see for an effect size of a half, and these are different gamma and the power, and then, so here, red is the, um, a sample size of 200. Uh, then you go up to a sample size of 2,000, blue. You know, if you look at each gamma, the power gain is not very, you know, it's only a little bit compared, for you, you're increasing the sample size 10 times. Um, and then you, if you go here to the green, all the way up to a sample size of 20,000, um, you still, um, the power gain is kind of minuscule. And it looks like the power, you know, below this kind of black line is going toward one, um, but in a, after the black line, it's going toward zero, and that's um, that's what happens. That uh, um, there's a, a limit that the design sensitivity that below that limit, the power goes to one as the sample size goes to infinity, and above that limit, the power goes to zero. Um, but where you can really uh, gain, and what, what splitting gains from, is that if if you if you if you had a bigger effect size, then the design sensitivity would shift all the, over here and the powers would go way up. So the big advantage of splitting is that if you can figure out in the planning sample which is the outcome that ha has a bigger effect size, then it, it can get a much higher power. Um, and then comparing split sample to Bonferroni in observational studies, well, bon Bonferroni permits all null hypotheses to have p-values that are uniformly distributed like this. And that's, that's correct in randomized experiments that nulls have uniform p-values. But, but what happens in observational studies is, like so say here you had this where effect size a half. Say you're looking at gamma is five, so there's where there's no power. The, the p-values are not uniformly distributed. They, they instead, they cluster near one. Um, and so Bonferroni's being conservative in assuming that they're, they're uniformly distributed. And um, the, the split sampling, it, it can screen out the hypotheses and never had a chance in greatly reducing the multiplicity correction. The, the other advantage of split sampling is that you, you get to look at the planning sample and can do any kind of exploratory analysis you want. 
and that can generate unanticipated insights. I'll illustrate that in, in this study of the effect of uh, maternity ward closures in Philadelphia. So from 1997 to 2019, 14 of the 19 maternity wards that were open in 97 closed. Uh, in most cases it was just a ward, but in, in this case it was a whole hospital, and this is the last day the hospital was open, the employees in protest uh, decorated the building like respiratory was here, you know, lifesaver, uh, medicine was here. Um, so are the, and nothing similar happened in terms of closures like this at, 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 in other major cities. Um, and so the, the, um, the, the question we're looking at is did the closures negatively affect maternal and neonatal outcomes? And we had 45 outcomes in our data set. Um, so we, we had data from 1995 to 2003, so the, before the closures started, 95, 96 were before the closures started. Um, and we built a, a sort of a control Philadelphia, so we, we had data from the rest of Pennsylvania, California, Missouri. And we built a control Philadelphia in which we matched Philadelphia births to a birth in the rest of Pennsylvania, California, or Missouri. And, and he, we, we matched a whole bunch of covariates to include things about the mom's neighborhood, the mom's age, um, the prenatal care, or mom's education, mom's race, mom's health insurance, and some characteristics of the baby like birth weight and gestational age. So we, we have a lot of, because we, we have every birth from, in Philadelphia from 1995 to 2003, those are our treated. So we have 132,786 matched pairs. We have, we have a huge number of matched pairs. So we, we, we did a 10% a planning sample. Um, and we looked at the 45 outcomes in that 10% planning sample. Um, and we, we tested whether there's a treatment effect um, of the closures. And um, so this, this black line here is a p-value of 0.05. So there, there was only one outcome that, that was affected. And this, even, even if you do a Bonifroni correction, this would still be significant. This, so this, this outcome that seemed to be affected is birth injuries to the skeleton. Um, now, an another thing we found from exploring the planning sample was that we, we knew that in 2000, Philadelphia had intervened to, to slow down and organize the closures. Um, but like my uh, neonatal collaborator, he, he thought that this was just a symbolic gesture that didn't really have an effect. But then when we looked at the planning sample, it did seem like the, the, um, that uh, most of any effect was occurring before 2000. So based on this, the planning sample, we decided to focus on birth injuries as a skeleton, comparing the period 97 to 99 after the closures to 95, 96 before the closures. Um, so this is, these are the results. So this is showing um, in, um, in pairs in which one baby had a birth injury as a skeleton, whether it was a pair, whether the Philadelphia baby was injured or the control baby. So prior to, in the base period before the closure started, a little more than half of the time it was the Philadelphia baby was injured. But then after the closure started, um, the, the Philadelphia baby was more likely to be injured close to three quarters of the time. So we estimated that the closures increased the birth injuries of skeleton by an odds ratio of 1.67 and it was highly significant. Uh, and then this shows a sensitivity analysis. So again, it was, it was sensitive at gamma is 1.21. So it's not, it's, uh, definitely not very insensitive, but it's also not super sensitive. Um, now, the, by doing the split sampling, we, we correctly account for selecting hypotheses from the data because we, we, we test the hypotheses out on a fresh, fresh sample. Um, but there are two sort of selections that are not accounted for by split sampling. I want to mention um, selective bias and selective interpretation of importance. So. Um, Selective bias versus the, the, the bias from unmeasured confounding might differ between outcomes. Um, so when we select the outcome with the smallest p-value, we might just be selecting the outcome with the biggest bias from unmeasured confounding. So it might just be that birth injury to the skeleton is the outcome that's most biased, and that's why we're seeing it have the smallest p-value. We, we don't think that's the case in this study, but it's something to be aware of uh, in general when, when um, using um, split sampling or other methods to select hypotheses. Um, another issue, selection issue comes up is selective interpretation of importance. So, so we actually had 45 outcomes, so let me just illustrate it with say you had three. So say you have outcomes A, B, and C. Um, now say that if forced a priori to rate their public health importance, 
a researcher might, might rate them as B is most important, then A, then C. But if you selected A in the planning sample, you know, then you know, people are good at coming up with explanations and might, a researcher might think of a reason why now it seems like A is most important. And if, if C was selected, maybe the researcher would think of a reason why C was most important. Um, so there can be this post hoc inflation of importance. And the split sample doesn't protect us from that post hoc inflation of importance. Um, so two, two potential remedies to this selective interpretation of importance are, one is what we could a priori decide on the relative importance of the outcomes. But that's going to be hard to do. It's maybe doable with three, but to ask people to go through 45 outcomes uh, is hard. I think you know, maybe a more practical way is you can say, you know, in your protocol, you can say that regardless of what we see in the planning sample, there's, there's some pre-specified outcome or outcomes that we're always going to include because they're of broad interest. So like here we might, these three outcomes, we'd say we're always going to look at these because the, these, I mean, infant death, that's kind of, you know, the, the worst outcome which we, we care most about. I mean, then um, sort of a broad measure of complications for infants is, you know, if there was any infant complication, and a broad measure of complications for mothers is whether there were any maternal complication. And now, if, so if we're now going to look at these four outcomes, we need to, on the analysis sample, and we still, we still want to control the family-wise error rate, we, instead of just doing 95% confidence intervals, we, we use Bonferroni and, and have 98.75% confidence intervals um, to get a 95% family-wise coverage rate. Um, and then what we see is, okay, infant death, you know, no significant effect, although it's at least in it, the, the direction is that the closures cause more infant deaths. For any infant complication, there is a significant effect. It's not as big as for birth injuries the skeleton, but it is in, in, in the same uh, direction and it's significant. Um, and then there doesn't seem to be much of an effect of the closures on maternal complications. So in, in, in summarizing about multiple outcomes, um, in observational studies compared to randomized trials, there's more of an incentive to consider multiple outcomes. Um, split sampling is one uh, potentially useful approach, but we need to pay attention to selective bias and selective interpretation of importance, and uh, it's useful to include one pre-specified outcome of overall interest. Uh, so the, the last kind of consideration I want to talk about that's different in observational studies and randomized trials is, is how to think about uh, incorporating subgroups. So like in the football study, well, we would have loved to have information about position because they may have you know, different amounts of hits and stuff. We, that, that wasn't in our data. But we could have considered you know, different fo football effects within subgroups of, say, whether uh, parental income or teacher-encouraged college or other variables. Um, so the, the, the traditional clinical trialist viewpoint on subgroups is that is that subgroup analyses should be secondary and shouldn't be part of the primary analysis. So this, like, this is an example. Pito et al. said, the largest and most important bias that is still very commonly introduced during the statistical analysis of randomized trials is that produced by unduly data-dependent emphasis on the results in particular subgroups. Hence, it is often the overall results of a trial that should chiefly be emphasized. Um, and so the, the kind of the, their logic is that um, they, uh, Pito et al. assume no qualitative effect modification. In other words, the, the direction of effect doesn't reverse between subgroups. So that if there's a positive effect in one subgroup, there shouldn't be a negative effect in another subgroup. Um, if in a randomized trial, so by this, using this logic, if, if we find, if we compare the overall treatment and control group, and we find a significant beneficial effect of treatment, then Pito et al. and others would say, okay, you know, that shouldn't change any, any subgroup analysis wouldn't change clinical decisions because if there's an overall positive effect and there's no overall qualitative effect modification, you should be treating everybody. Um, so that's, here's another set of uh, well-known clinical trialists, Altman and collaborators said, when subgroup effects are in the opposite direction of the overall results, the most prudent approach is to consider subgroup findings as hypotheses for another trial. Until then, the best estimate of the treatment effect for any subgroup is the overall treatment effect. So uh, are there any different considerations in observational studies? Um, well, in remember, a big difference in observational studies is that we only typically find evidence for causal effect compelling if it's insensitive to some bias. Like we had this quote we talked about from Sir Richard Dahl, which saying that he only considers an epidemiologic study persuasive if, if, the, 
it's insensitive at gamma is 3. So in an observational study, if we were to find a significant overall effect, but it was sensitive to bias, say, less than gamma is 3, then the suggested clinical decision might be to still not treat until further evidence is found. However, if you found a subgroup that was um, insensitive to bias at gamma is 3, then you might say, okay, now we have solid evidence that the treatment is effective for that subgroup. And if you assume no qualitative effect modification, then, then you would say, okay, then we should treat everybody because if it's positive in a subgroup, it's also going to be positive for the, or um, not harmful for the whole population. So finding a subgroup which has a larger effect, even if all subgroups have a positive effect, uh, has particular value in observational studies. Um, so one, one way we can try to um, incorporate subgroups in observational studies is, is a, sp a split sample approach because um, oftentimes we have many covariates that might form our subgroups so we don't know which subgroups we want to look at. So in the split sample approach what we could do is we construct match pairs um, of a treated control and then take some planning sample like um, in, 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 this, in these works it's a 25 percent planning sample and then what we can do is so then we, have, we take the treated minus control in, in the matched pairs in this planning sample, and then we have the covariates that might be part of our subgroups, and we fit a cart tree to those treatment control differences on those covariates. And then the subgroups we get, the leaves we get from the tree, are the subgroups that we then go on to test in the analysis sample. Uh, and, and a test we can use is we can multiply out the p-values together, um, and then truncating those above 0.2 to 1. So this, this truncated product test, it's, it's like Fisher's combination test, but it just the truncation um, performs a little bit better in observational studies. And then we can test for sort of any effect, and then we can test within subgroups and control the family-wise error rate using closed testing. So I'll illustrate this on um, a, a study about malaria. Um, so this, this is, an, so malaria is a, um, you know, is a, a, it's a disease caused by mosquitoes carrying a, a parasite, um, and it uh, um, particularly affects uh, uh, children in the worst areas in, in Africa. So this this is um, uh, um, a boy is sick with malaria from a hospital. From uh, the, um, I uh, collaborate with a group that works at this hospital. Um, the and so the study we're looking at here is the world uh, the World Health Organization. Is, it's an observational study of spraying with an insecticide together with mass administration of an anti-malarial drug. And it was it was an observational study where the the, the investigators chose. Which, which people to treat based on their judgment and convenience. Um, so we, we matched, there are two covariates that we had available in the data set that could perform subgroups, uh, age and gender. And so we matched on those um, variables. And um, so here's, th th this is what the, the out, uh, it's hard to see, the, the, out, the outcome, um, it, it's, so they, they take a, um, a blood sample and then they apply a, um, a a stain to it that makes the, um, the malaria parasites appear purple. And then they divide this field, sort of this slide into 200 fields and count how many, in how many fields are there malaria parasites. And then, and then the outcome is, is you take a sort of, uh, uh, this outcome in the post-treatment period after the treatment is applied minus the pre-treatment period. And so we, so we can, so in our planning sample we have 390 match pairs. We computed this uh, treatment minus control of this outcome um, and fit it on a car trend, age and gender. And, and the, the tree just split in one place uh, for, for age. So, so this says that you know, if, if the age was less than nine and a half, then, then the average effect that was that the, the treatment pushed down this number of fields with, a uh, number of these 200 fields with parasites by an average of 30. Whereas when it was age was greater than nine and a half, there was, um, um, not much, I say this should be age greater than nine and a half. So the, the, uh, the, there was not much of an effect for older children and adults, but there was, was a um, strong effect for um, younger children. Um, and so what, what we did in the split, so then the split sample, we then took the 75% analysis sample, the 1170 pairs, and then we, we um, multiplied together the p-values for the two groups um, and, and used this truncated product test. And we compare that to just an aggregate test in which you um, use the whole 100% sample and, and just 
uh, test for an overall effect, not making any distinction by age. Um, and this, this shows the sensitivity analysis. Uh, so it shows, so, so here is just, at gamma is one, both, both, um, both methods show, showed an effect of the treatment. Uh, but the, using the aggregate, the, the results were sensitive at gamma is two. Whereas for the split sample that, 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 that used these subgroups, the, 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 um, the results were, were sensitive at gamma is 4.7. So there was a, a huge gain in sort of um, finding insensitivity to bias here from using the split sample and finding the subgroups. So this illustrates how uh, making use of subgroups in observational studies can be important. Um, so I'm going to uh, finish out the talk by just uh, briefly describing three, three open problems. I think. Um, so one is I, I talked a lot about you know, split samples as one method that could be used uh, with protocols. I think there's a lot of open questions about, okay, you know, what should the planning sample fraction be in different situations? Um, another is, you know, I, I talked about just having a planning sample and an analysis sample. Maybe, you, uh, maybe a sequential analysis method could be developed in which you have a planning sample and have the possibility of taking a further planning sample. And so I think that's something that would be useful to be developed. Um, an, another class of sort of open problems has to do with it. Um, in, in protocols, oftentimes, although it's spec we specify our analysis, we don't specify our interpretation. And you can run into problems of, I talked about selective interpretation of importance. Another kind of problem is, uh, so here's another example of a selective interpretation problem. Um, so this, came, this was about how best to report the results of a study with an insignificant primary analysis, but a s significant secondary analysis and a post hoc explanation. Um, it, it came up in a study I worked on on the effect of mountaintop mining on low birth weight. Um, so mount, in, mountaintop mining is used in Appalachia. Uh, so it used to be most coal mining in Appalachia was underground. But more uh, recently, coal companies found it's cheaper to, if they find a, mount, uh, a, a mountaintop with coal, what, what they do is they, they, they blast off the top of the mountaintop, um, uh, use dynamite, blast it off, and then dump, dump the, the mountaintop into the uh, valley below and then mine. So it's, it's bad for the environment and there's concerns about health. And so, that, so we did this study on the effect on low birth weight. Uh, we, we wrote a protocol that we posted on archive and our, we said our primary analysis was going to be the effect during the peak mountain, the period where this mountaintop mining was at its peak in 1999 to 2011. And then we said we'd have two secondary analysis periods, sort of before the peak and after the peak. Uh, so this is, so we, we, did, we matched counties where, in blue where there's mountaintop mining to con match control counties in yellow in, in the four states, West Virginia, Kentucky, Virginia, Tennessee, that, that, that didn't have mountaintop mining. Um, and the results were, so this is the odds ratio for low birth weight in mountaintop mining counties versus control. So in the early period, the, the, the comp, this is the estimate and the confidence, 95 percent confidence interval. So the confidence interval contained one, uh, so no, no significant effect. And then the primary analysis period, uh, again, the, the confidence interval contained one, no significant effect. But we found this significant effect in the post period, you know, sort of in the, in the, the later period, um, uh, secondary analysis period, that mountaintop mining increased the risk of low birth rate. Um, so then we, we, we wrote in our conclusion, we found evidence in secondary analyses that mountaintop mining was associated with increased odds of low birth weight in 2012 to 2017 and did not find such evidence for earlier time periods. A potential explanation for this pattern of association is that mountaintop mining caused an increase in low birth weight, but its onset was delayed. And then we went on to talk about one reason for the delay it could be that it may take time for the, the mountaintop mining to affect the area's hydrology, which affects the wa water supply. Um, but I wondered, you know, did we pay too much heed to a secondary analysis finding in the conclusion, and did, did we selectively interpret the findings? Because we, you know, uh, you know, before we did the study, we were thinking that you know, if, if there was going to be an effect, it should be strongest in the period where, where the mountaintop mining was what is at its peak. Um, so, so this is a problem of, sort of potentially selectively interpreting findings um, that, you know, where you didn't specify the interpretation in the protocol. So an, an extreme remedy for that is what we could do is we could, we could basically write a paper with blanks for, for results, you know, different results we might get, and then we could write different discussions and conclusions that would be 
presented based on what the results are. So it's kind of like um, when I was a kid, I would read these uh, choose your own adventure books in which you would, uh, the, 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 you would get to choose what the character would do at various points, and then the author would send you to different pages based on what you chose. So the author had to write many different stories. Um, so we could try to do that in our protocol. We could write many different uh, papers and say, you know, how would we interpret different results? Um, so the, the problems with that is it's, 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 probably, it's harder to think insightfully about results that hypothetically could occur than just thinking about those that did occur. And it's uh, time, it would be time consuming, but it, it might be worth trying out. Um, I think in general, it would be useful to have more empirical research on how readers interpret language around secondary findings and abstracts so that we're making sure we're, 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 we're um, you know, our, our language is reflecting how uh, people are interpreting them. Um, uh, the last sort of open problem I want to mention is, relates to stability analysis. So in, in a complex observational study analysis, there's typically numerous analytical decisions. And so the stability analysis asks, are the results stable to these decisions? Um, we, um, uh, so one, one stability analysis we did in this mountaintop mining study is we, th there, there were some counties that were bordering mountaintop mining counties. And there might have been spillover. So we did a stability analysis in which we excluded those bordering counties as potential controls. And it turned out we got pretty similar results. Um, but a, a question is, kind of, uh, oftentimes like in, particularly in economics papers, I've seen they have tons of stability analyses. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, the positive is it's, it gives you some reassurance that conclusions aren't artifacts of apparently innocuous decisions. But too much stability, if, if you're doing too much stability analysis that's analyzing all kinds of thing, decisions that you think are, are right decisions and looking at what would happen, it can make it hard to critically evaluate a study. Say you have 250 stability analyses that are done and 240 support the original findings. But well, you can't just count it up. If, if, if the 10 that don't support the original findings are, are actually making good, better decisions than 240 that are supporting it, then, then you should think that the study is not reliable. So you really have to dig into these 10 that don't support the original findings to, to accurately assess the study. Um, but say two stability analyses are done and one support the original finding. Now there's just one study, you know, one stability analysis you really need to dig into. So it may be sometimes better for the, um, the authors to, to figure out what are the important stability analyses and, and, and focus on those. Um, and one area that stability analysis comes up that relates to matching is uh, when I present on matching, I sometimes have gotten the comment, why, don't, why are you just presenting me with one match result? I want to see what happens if I do some different matches and, and whether the results are, are stable. Um, and so the, the answer I've given that I've read other places is that matching is like an experimental design. In experimental design, we try to choose the best design. We don't, we don't try to choose several designs and then rerun the experiment with inferior designs. Um, at the same time, if you if you did you know if you do matching and and you have matches that produce somewhat s similar balance and, and quite different outcomes, that sort of instability would be disquieting. So I think it, it would be useful to better understand. I think there could be more work done in sort of how to think about stability analysis and matching. Um, so in, in, in summary, a, a protocol is an important component of making an observational study reliable. There are some different considerations in protocols for observational studies versus randomized trials. Um, further research on, I think there's a lot of further research could be done on methods for observational study protocols would be useful. Um, and I'm hoping we have, can have some good discussion now and be, also be very happy to correspond by email about about the talk and also can pro provide uh, references for the talk. So uh, thanks a lot for listening.
data, for example, on the outcome, uh, and you're still designing, but it's still an observational study. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's a great um, point. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely, yes, that, that, that would, obviously, then, then you'd be back more like in the randomized trial setting where at least, you know, the, the protocol would also sort of, um, you know, would, would kind of protect against any kind of um, d dishonesty in the, 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 the um, of, um, because you'd be forced to say what your analysis was in advance of um, the the outcome. I mean, I and, and also it would um, uh, I, I, um, I guess then you'd be much more in the situation where um, yeah, well. It, I mean, oftentimes, then, then, then the matching you would be doing would be for the purpose of collecting the data rather than just some, sometimes then you, you wouldn't, um, uh, and, and so, so that, um, I mean, that leads, I guess, to different considerations in matching because you're not, it's not like you have all the, you're, you're trying to figure out who, who to match, and, but um, uh, so it's a little more like a randomized trial protocol, but, but it's some similar considerations. Yeah, no, that, that that's a great question. Um, yeah, I don't have a I, I don't have a great answer. I mean, you know, one can, I think maybe maybe a, a direction of research would be trying to think about how much bias there, you know, at least with some simulation studies to try to see how much bias is introduced by the fact that, that you that you know a little piece of the you you know what one analysis produced, um, and there there might be some corrections you could you could do for kind of. Accounting for the fact that you know, you, you you know you know a little bit about the the outcome of of the previous study. Yeah, no, that, that's a good question. And the methods, I, um, you know, I, 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 I tend toward the, the, the really designing, yeah, not looking at the outcome data, uh, but there are, there is a lot of work, you know, like with doubly robust methods and stuff that, that does incorporate how you can, um, you know, use the outcome data in, in, in the, um, in, in sort of doing variable selection in the analysis. And so one thing, you know, in the protocol, you could just try to specify um, much more, you know, clearly how, so, you know, another direction people have gone is, you know, with things like uh, BART and causal force is to be very, is to say we're going to um, not match in advance, but we're going to um, have a very flexible way of analyzing the outcome data, and we're going to, spe and if you sort of specify that very clearly in advance, that can be a, another um, approach that can be incorporated into a protocol, and maybe it makes sense if you don't know much about what covariates are going to matter. Well, yeah, at least the, the, being very clear about the process by which you will, um, let's say, fit a, a, a flexible regression model. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So I guess, I guess that that's one advantage of this, the split sampling approach. You have enough data is because you can then do any kind of explore EDA on the um, the planning sample. Um, there are a few things you can do, even looking at the outcome data with EDA, and still, like for example, you can, in in, in say match pairs, if you don't look at who's the treatment and control, but you just look at the two outcomes together, 
um, you can you can look at that and not bias a uh, treatment effect estimate, and and so th then you can at least explore for outliers. Yeah, no, that's all. Uh, th thanks, thanks. Um, yeah, I think I think in terms of yeah the uh, you're right, the first point about the unmeasured confounding. Yeah, we definitely were worried about that. That was kind of the sensitivity analysis was trying to get at least how sensitive the results are to that. But we could, you know, uh, it would be great if, to follow up more with them, individual police officers about what they were thinking. Um, I, yeah, I, I agree. I think that's a you know an important point you make about you know we don't want the protocol to be a straitjacket. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think, I think that'd be a good direction for more research, you know, how, how can we bring in sort of allowable um, amendments, and, and but also point out, you know, if you have a protocol, but then you can also, any findings you report that weren't in your original protocol, it's not like you should dismiss them, it's just you clearly label them, this was something, this was more of a post hoc finding, so at least, at least the audience knows what was, Specified and what was post hoc. That doesn't, you should still go ahead and report post hoc uh, findings. And, um, so, yeah, thanks. Bill, you've been testing talk. Thanks. Uh, I have a question about the researcher hope bias. I've got a little trouble understanding like, why it's special or different for the other bias that I'm matching. And I guess what I'm thinking is if you're running a randomized trial and you do power analysis beforehand, maybe you run your power analysis and you realize that you need more samples and you budget more. So you could like, uh, you might be tempted to tweak your anticipated effect size up higher or something so that all of a sudden your sample size would match up with your budget and then, you know, that way hope that it was basically to run a bad study. But if you ran that bad study, you wouldn't analyze it any differently. There wouldn't really be any bias. In the same way, I guess, in an observational study case, if you match up two of variables because you're kind of hoping that you could keep this larger sample size, you might end up with a bad study, but it will really see how you Right. Yeah, I know it's a good point. I guess I guess my my, my concern is kind of that, that these, in some studies I've been involved in, it's kind of like there there's this subjective point where, where the the subject matter experts decide, need, need to decide what to control for, and then sometimes I feel like you know when I've uh, presented them a certain uh, you know match, and they say. Uh, we're not going to uh, we're not going to learn anything. So um, probably the, the you know then they may come up with a variable. They think oh maybe that doesn't matter. And 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 so that there's kind of this bias in in that they they they, they sort of know that they really need to control for it, but they they're hoping that they don't. Um, that they're, they're somehow just hoping that it works out if they don't control for it.
<laughs> yeah, no, it's good. I mean, it probably, yeah, something kind of better, yeah, more, more study, more, both more, um, uh, you know, analytical and methodological work, also just more case studies of seeing how it works out. I mean, I mean, um, you know, try, tried it a few times. It, it has worked out pretty well, um, but um, I think it's really something that has to be ex ex explored a lot more. Um, I mean, there, there is kind of a, a, another thing we've been working on. It's sort of a, a, a compromise called cross-screening, in which you divide your data into two halves, and then you, you can actually look at both Halves, but you, you you need to have two different teams to to do it. Um, so we we're, we're trying that out in a study. But, uh. we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, I have a question about your subgroup analysis and motivation. It's probably my lack of understanding. What do you say, my understanding? So it seems like you say subgroup analysis is really good with observational studies because with observational studies you have a big effect size. Subgroup analysis, nobody, everybody believes that there's not a lot of heterogeneity between different subgroups. So if you find one subgroup that has a higher effect size than the others, then you can say, well, it's no one goes the same as that. So now your effect size is high enough that um, you can say this effect is really there. And, and so to me, it, that was kind of the, my impression of the logic of the subgroup analysis. And, and, yeah, I, I guess your, your first thing about sort of that there's not much heterogeneity, I, I guess I would say my understa understanding of kind of what some of the clinical trialists have argued is not so much that there's not heterogeneity, but that it doesn't, it doesn't matter for, for clinical decisions because it's not, it's not changing the, the direction. But I guess what I'm saying, in observational studies, if there is this heterogeneity that doesn't change the direction, but is, but is something like in the, my example, like, you know, I think there is a positive effect of this treatment on malaria for, for all the age groups, but it's much bigger for the, the younger children. And so there's, there's more of a, if you figure that out in a clinical trial, you know, that might be interesting, but it's not going to necessarily change the clinical decisions. But here, in an observational study, if, it, if, it, if, it, if it's enough to convince you that there's a real effect, um, then, it would, then, then you would actually be more willing to, to treat. Um, whereas if, if you just looked at everybody and the effect wasn't, wasn't that big, you might say, I'm, I'm not convinced that there's a real effect here. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So you're saying, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, yeah, if, if the whole field is ignored, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, one thing that's, um, I haven't, it, it, uh, I mean, I mean, um, ideally with the protocol, you know, if, if you, um, the ideal is to actually, you know, publish and get, com you know, at least get, get public comment on it. And that's, um, and, and, and then at least that would give people, you know, from different perspectives to be able to, to comment on it. Um, that, um, yes, that's a, that'd be the ideal. Um, 
Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm hoping with, with, with the police department to do, do follow up to get more um, uh, qualitative information about what, um, like the, 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 the reports they wrote of the narratives were, were just kind of what happened and not, not so much about what their thought process was about future violence risks. So that's hoping to be able to do like follow up interviews with them, but, but um, the, the, unfortunately the, the police commissioner changed from the one that uh, my, I mean, it's not something that I, I would have the contacts to my, my collaborator, Susan Sorensen, she's the one who had the contact with the police department. So she's trying to um, establish some relationship with the, with the new commissioner. But, uh, yeah, no, that's true, right. Yeah, no, that, I mean, I, that's a good point. I agree, it's a hard problem. I guess so. the, the kind of thing I've f focused on more in my own work is kind of just using the subgroups as a way of um, helping, you know, to overall assess, assess the strength of evidence for, for, for an effect rather than sort of uh, trying to make a claim that, that there is, that this, that there really is a, a, a heterogeneous effect. Um, so um, I agree that's a hard, uh, problem. I mean, there are there are a lot of neat methods that are being developed. Um, you know, um, things with like uh, uh, causal force and stuff that may be useful. But one more question. Do you have enough energy for me? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we, we fortunately in, in, our, in our data, no no one was um, no one w was killed in, in a follow up call, at least that we were uh, aware of. But 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 we may not have been been aware of it. But um, it's definitely definitely an important issue. And I, I think one of the things we realized after doing the study is that maybe our outcome wasn't really the initially we thought we just wanted to reduce calls, but then we realized that that you know maybe um, maybe a call is is Beneficial in that it means that the the, the 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 victim feels more comfortable calling for assistance. So we think afterwards, thinking about you know what what might be better outcomes to measure. What we really want is, which as you said, a re reduction in violence. So I want to thank you all for attending um, uh, to help help us celebrate with Dylan, and uh, thank you again to Dylan for, for the lecture.